You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as normal, and we're joined this week by former Reds midfielder Guy Moussi to talk about his career and what he's up to these days in work and in life. Guy, hello, how are you? I'm very good and you. Nice to, uh, nice to see you and uh, thank you for the invite. Oh, no, thank you for coming on. I'm very grateful for you to come on and talk to people about your career, being a popular former player. Um, I wanted to start, before we get to your time at Forest, I was really interested to hear about your, your early life and how you came into football. I mean, did you always think we, you were going to be a footballer? Were you kind of the best player on the park or not as a kid? As a kid, as, as a kid, I was one of the best in my neighborhood, that's for sure. But um, I never like really thought about being a, a professional footballer. I think it's a, it's most likely, you know, it's a, for me, I, I believe that is a popular sport, which means um, you don't need to have money, for example. You just have, you, you grab a pair of socks, you're rolling around, you play football, you grab um, an empty uh, bottle of water, you kick on, you kick on it. Uh, so, so for me, it was like just, you know, when you hang out with friends and then you just want to play at something, it was, it was football. So it was more building up the love like that when I was young, instead of thinking that you want to be professional at it, because when you're five years old or six years old or whatever, you don't even know what it is. And especially at the time, maybe nowadays people are more aware, but because, uh, you know, uh, all the financial that are behind, behind, behind this football, but at the time, it's it wasn't that big, I would say. So it was just like you know, doing for fun with friends. What was your route into professional football then? Did you kind of stumble into it? Did someone spot you and just give you a chance to come and train with a club? Um, uh, it came late a little bit um, for me. I think about fifteen, sixteen, because in France, a lot of people, you know, going into um, into academies really early, like thirteen, something like that. And when you when you when I, when when you used to go at the time at 15 16 it was kind of a little bit late and um so i was playing with friends and uh, no, a lot of people knew that in my neighborhood i was with my cousin uh two of the best players in our generation and uh, they come to my mom and they say you know there is like um, an academy academy team that's my one of uh, my friends uh, and then his parents come to my to my to my mom and say, you know, our son playing for an academy team, and uh, uh, it would be good to uh, go on a trial. So I went on a trial with my cousin, and um, you you went from there. How did you end up in Nottingham then? Because we've had former players on here before, and they often say, oh, I knew all about Forest through the European Cup wins and the great history of the club. Uh, you're the first player from a different country we've ha- we've had on, so. Were you fully familiar with Forest history and was it easy to come here? Not at all, not at all. And to be fair, I've said it many times, is um, to be true, truth, um, I didn't want to come to Nottingham. Um, I had a brilliant season with a second division team, my former team, Angers. And uh, at the time, I've got a lot of first team, um, I would say, Premier League team in France, uh, La Ligue 1. Uh, some, some, some good teams wanted me. And uh, but it's it was kind of a, I was reaching a, a cycle while I've played for the club for six years. I went through injuries, came back up, uh, came back from injuries, been one of the best players at the, in, in in few season, and uh, I was reaching a time that I needed a, a fresh and new challenge. And um, Nottingham Forest came to me, and I've seen on a, I remember seeing it on the on the paper while being in vacation. And uh, my agent didn't even talk to me about, about that opportunity, but I was like, ah, no, I'm not really interested because I wanted to play. My target was go first in a Premier League team in France, then maybe go to, to see abroad. But um, the team that I was supposed to sign to was Lille at the time. But um, the, the manager, maybe you, you must know him, it's a French manager that's, that, that, that was at uh, Samsonton, which is a club Puel. And he was also. Oh, yeah, Leicester as well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, he, he was desperate to sign me, and in the same transfer window, he, um, he signed for Lyon at the time. But the big Lyon, you know, Lyon that <laughs> used to win the title every season. So, so then the, the recruitment was to another level. And uh, so the team of Lille were waiting for the new manager to come and, and, and then to finalize all the, the transfers. But I was reaching a time that I came back to the preseason with my former team, Angers, and I was like, no, 
I need to go now because if I wait too much, I don't want to be uh, in between. Uh, my mind want to be in another team, and then myself, I'm, I want to still commit it to to Ange because I'm professional. And then from that, doing a, a bad preseason, which is going to lead for a bad beginning of the season and no transfer. So I was like, I need to find a team right now. And Nottingham Forest was the the opportunity that was proper ready to, you know, to put the the, the money on the table and make the, the transfer happen. And uh, I remember it's David Frio at the time, which he was a former player at uh, at Forest. I yeah. think um, during his last spell, his last year, he become a little bit like a, a scout for the club. So he come to watch me with uh, Keith Burt uh, many, many times. And, um, and at the time, they asked me to come to Nottingham to visit the city, to visit the football club uh, and, and another, another proper ID. And uh, when I first came, uh, it's so weird because I feel like I feel home straight away. I feel comfortable. You know, when you never left uh, your country and uh, you have this apprehension of oh, what's going to happen, new country, I don't speak English, blah, blah, blah. And uh, but finally, I just like I just came here and was pretty, pretty good. And um, I went I, I watched the, the last game of the season uh, when Forrest got promoted where, with the goal of of uh, Julian Bennett when he did <laughs> <laughs> this crazy tackle and yeah, yeah. the free kick of Luis Magugan and I think it was a Chris Commons also I scored one goal and um, I always say I remember that uh, so when I came to Nottingham Forest to have a discussion with uh, Colin Cardwood that which was the, the manager at the time so I was with my agent and then so they wanted to show me the atmosphere of the city ground, the number of people that was there. And it was quite kind of crazy because I was in second division. In my mind, I was like, okay, I play in second division f- team in France. This is a third division team because I didn't know much about the club. And they got just got promoted. So I was thinking, okay, so it could be like a third division team in France that game promoted me in the second division. And then I've seen the last game of the season with 30,000 people with the ad <laughs> that was crazy. I was like, whoa, because at the time, one of the big clubs in France calling uh, FC Nantes went down to the championship, so the second division in France. And my former team, Angers and FC Nantes, is, is like, it's not, I won't say that it's like Nottingham and Derby, but then they're really close by, they're like 45 minutes, so it's a kind of a derby. But then when we play in ch- against each other this season before I signed for Forest, the season before I signed for Forest, it was like 12,000 people. And then for me, it was crazy. It was like <laughs> I played the final of the World Cup with a lot of people. And then I come and I watch this game. It's like 13,000 people for a third division team that game promoted. I was mm. like, I can't be that real. <laughs> and um, I remember seeing the tackle of uh, Andrew. Because in France, we were like, OK, if you come to England, it's a physical football. And the lower you go, and then the, mo- the less footballistic it is, it's more athletic. So when I, I heard the second division, I was like, oh, it won't be good football or whatever. And I've seen the tackle of Julian Bennett. I was like, whoa. And I elbowed my, my edge and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming there. So um, I went back. So after the, the visiting the city, but I was really impressed about the facilities also, about the pitch. Because in France at the time, we didn't have like really good pitch. But the training pitch were even better than our official um football matching pitch at on at Angers. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And um so we went back to France with my Asian and uh I was like okay now I need to think about it. But I was like no nah, I don't want to go. And I asked the question, let's say I asked for 20 people between co ex coaches, friends, family members and then when I start to, uh, to or some of my family members heard in the news that oh Nottingham Forest wanted to sign me and they were like, whoa, that's a huge club. You don't even know. They won twice the Champions League and everything. I was like, okay. And uh, like I grew up always being like a, the type of player that never watched football. So mm-hmm. you could have mentioned me, for example, I tried to exaggerate it a little bit, but then Pele or Maradona, I would have said, oh, who is that? But not those big ones, but then some of them, you know. And then the, the reason why it was because basically all I wanted for me, it was playing football. So I didn't know I didn't know much about the history of uh, of Nottingham Forest, but then when my uh, family members told me that they won twice the Champions League, I was like to be to won twice the Champions League in the road, the only one in the history at the time. Must be a big club. Then I remember when I came here and I've seen all the fines 
uh, when they got promoted, I was like, okay. And uh, so I went back home and I spoke with many, many people, family members and stuff like that. And uh, I wanted to wait only to have only one person that would have said, no, don't go, to, don't go on there. It's, it's no point. Then I would have said to my agent, no, I don't want to go there. But everybody said, oh, you will enjoy it with your type of football, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay. So I came back to the preseason. I done two days in the preseason. I was like, okay, I need to make my decision. And uh, anyway, I wanted to have a fresh start somewhere else. And this is how I decided to come to, to Michigan Forest. What was it like moving? I mean, what age would you have been? 21, 22? Yeah, 22, I think, something like that, yeah. So what was it like moving as a, a young man to a, a foreign country? I don't know how good your English was then and if you came with family yeah. or anything, but it's a big step to take, isn't it, as a person? The funny part is when I came to do the first day of the preseason, when I took the flight to Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris to come to uh, to East Midland Air Airport, Hamza Ben Sherif was at the at the airport also because he was coming back to the preseason. And I was looking at him and he was looking at me. And I remember his face was familiar. And I remember because uh, one of the, um, the academy team that I play in Paris, Hamza was playing for the same team, but he was a youngster. He was like two to three years old, uh, younger than me. And, uh, but then straight away, I was like, I remember this face. And he came to me because he, he, he'd seen on the news that I signed for Forest and he remembered me. And, uh, and then for me, it was a big relief because I was like, okay, I'm not alone. I know someone that speaks French, someone from the, the same neighborhood I would say in Paris. So then you're going to help me to be able to feel, to feel home, you know, in, in Nottingham. And uh, so, so it, went, it went pretty well, to be fair. What was the dressing room like compared to a French dressing room in terms of the culture and the, the kind of sense of humour and settling into that? Was it a big difference between Angers and Nottingham? Not really. I think there is banter everywhere because I've I even been to Helsinki, which is, again, a different country. But I think it's international, you know, it's like... People come to the, to the trade dressing room who want to have jokes. And, um, you know, it's one of the difference, I would say, that I, I, I never had to experience that. But it, um, I came as a um, foreigner player. And I would say at the time in France, we didn't have that many foreigner players. So I don't know the way we would have act to introduce one of them someone that coming from abroad and not talking the same languages language etc etc but then what I can be thankful and blessed it's uh, that the teammate that i had um, they always welcome me at best so try to to help me in any type of ways to to feel comfortable you know to not let's say laughing at me because of my french accent or because the because i couldn't speak english or whatever um, you know, I remember Chris Cohen or even Kelvin Wilson or Julian Bennett. When I tried to speak English and I, I mentioned the, the wrong word, they were coming to me like, but really calm. No, you're supposed to say it like that, like that. And I think sometimes French people, sometimes we like, we like laughing at people. And I believe that maybe if it would be the opposite, we are, and then someone would have come to the French dressing room and try to speak French, maybe we, we would have tried to laugh at him because he couldn't speak properly. And uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, he helped me to try to make the effort and speak English. How did you adapt to the football then, Guy? Because Colin Caldwood wanted to play a certain way. He must have told his players what he wanted them to do. And you don't speak the language too well. How, how big a challenge was that in the early days? Um, I think the football for me is like, is, is simple, but it's true that some of the automatism that I had in France, because the French football is, is really like mathematic. So from young age to become professional, it's almost at the time, especially at the time, all the teams were used to play in 4-4-2, for example. So you have to just decide which position you're playing. And then in France, it was almost like, as soon as I got the ball in this position, I know that this player will move in this way. This play, let's say I receive the ball from the right back. I know that the striker will move like this. I know that the right, the right wing will move like this. I know that the 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 number ten will move move like that. So even before I receive the ball, I know my body position. I know how I'm gonna pass the ball. And then when I defend, it was the same thing. We defend. We we, we used to defend in zone and not like individuals. So those little things make a difference. I think in the way that I needed to adapt because. 
everything that was for me automatic and knew that okay the opposite team moving in like that i know that for example chris cohen will be there to cover and then suddenly no because we're playing in a, in, in a, like a individual marking so then chris cohen is not where he was supposed to be in my mind so this is the way that i needed to adapt and understand the the the, the the physiology of of um, Colin Calderwood and then of the player also because I remember some of the action for me it was so 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 clear that you have to do that and then it was no chance someone could have told me no, even if Colin Calderwood would have told me that no this is not what we, you're supposed to do I would have said you're lying this is not what you <laughs> but when you turn around and you see almost all the team believing in something totally different that you've been learning for 10 years then you're like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to just shut my mouth and uh, try to adapt it. <laughs> you spoke about before you signed, you saw the atmosphere at the ground. Do you recall your debut at the city ground, your first game and what it was like? And did you have people over watching from France to see it? Yes, I think my mom was there, I think, with my sister. And I'm not sure. I think nobody was there. No, I think nobody was there, you know. So, but I remember this game, it was against uh, Reading. It was against Reading when I, when I, 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 I strike the ball to the head of uh, Sonko. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, so that was the first game in, uh, in Sky. And, um, and that was my first game for, official game mm -hmm. for the man of the match. It was a really good game. And uh, the atmosphere was brilliant. It was brilliant. I should ask you about your first goal. I bet you don't do an interview where you're probably not asked about your match winner against Barnsley, but what, what are your memories of that? Because obviously you got sent off after it as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I'm not a goal scorer, so, so for me it was like... And I remember Amy Sutton at the time that used to be the secretary, she always told me that, when do you going to score? When do you going to score? Because we have this music, you know, the... the I think... Uh, I don't know if it was the moves, the moves, the moves is on fire, but she had another music that she wanted to play at the City Grand if I would have scored. I was like, okay, I'm going to score next time, next time. Well, the first season gone and I haven't scored. Then the second season came, I was like, I need to score goal at some point. And, uh, and then it's just like the dynamic that we were at the time. I think we were something like five games, five wins in a row. And um, and then I'm usually not a goal scorer, and I'm scoring at the 90th minute, and I just lost it. But then it's because in France also we don't have you know this kind of we have like a, a sometimes a barrier between the fans and the and the and the players. And then for me, like I was like I remember some action or some some I was visualizing some action at the time when some player used to jump on the on the crowd or whatever, and I thought that I could have done that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, by that point, Billy Davis was well and truly in, in charge. I mean, I, I'm sure the players were disappointed when Colin Calderwood left. But what do you what what do you remember of Billy coming in, and how would you describe Billy as a manager? Because all, all the players I've spoken to love him. Best for me is um, I think Billy Davis is um, I, I see him a little bit as a mentor, you know, I, mm. I, because. Some of the things that he's done, like make me, you know, I, I, I took it outside football to implement in my in my personal life, and um, and then for me it was like, for me I think he's the best. No, he's, without a doubt he must be the best manager that I, I play under, for sure, because of of the whole of his vision, of how he's able and how he's able to to bring the best out of the team or of an individual. He used to analyze a player and know, um, I would say, the love language of a player. He, he would know how to talk to Gimusi and know that if I touch him like that or talk to him like that, he's going to have a positive reaction. But if I talk with Raddy, he has to be different. If I talk to uh, Wes, uh, Wes Mag uh, Louis McGugan, it will be different. Wes Morgan, it will be different. And he used to know exactly his player and then how to talk to an individual and how to talk to the whole team. And I think it's, it's, it's brilliant. People talk about um, his planning and his detail and organisation. I mean, uh, was that second to none then when, when you were there? Yeah, I think everything was like, 
it was someone that gave us the, um, the, the the mental state to be on every single details mm. when you're eating when you're sleeping when you're going home um your mindset um everything he never left any details and he used to tell us that this is the the details this is what dictate a winner from a loser and um and yes it was it was it was amazing to to think that way and uh, i think it's really helped us as a as a youngster and then as a young boy that tried to become a man also you said he knew how to talk to you i mean how did you like to be spoken to did you respond well as a player to some players respond well to being shouted at and told off did you respond well to praise and an arm around the shoulder um not really and then it's funny because recently i re i realized and why i'm so connected to uh to nottingham forest and nottingham the city and the fans and then because i understood um i would say the way i i work i, I function and uh, i'm most likely someone like i'm a family guy and um and then for me it most like he used to know how to talk to me to show me that it puts it he would put his trust on me and then like i don't put pressure on you but i know that if i put my trust on you i can believe in you and then and then i'm someone like that so if you come and say gee i believe i believe in you i put my trust on you do this job can you do it if i say yes i will do it doesn't matter what you don't have to put pressure on me you don't have to 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 shout at me or whatever if i do something wrong i will know it and then if i know that you believe on on me to do this and then i make it wrong you don't have to shout at me for me to be sorry for the word but really pissed and um and then he knew that so he knew how to you know to talk to me to make me uh to make me uh feel or make me know that hey now this is your duty i don't want to talk to you i don't have to motivate you i want you to do that can you do it i would be like yes okay see you after the game and that's it you talk about your relationship with Billy being so good and you've spoken of your love of Forest. I mean, what was your relationship like with the fans then? I mean, when did you know that the fans had taken you to their heart and really liked you as a player? Um, I would say it's a little bit different. Regarding what I just said, for me it was, and then this is why I think that I, I, that I was so connected to the, to, the, to the ground, is because I felt the passion of the, food, the, of the people for the football clubs. For the football club and uh, and then for me it, more, it was we're reaching the same goal so my goal is to be the best on the field to be able to win game for the club and the the, the fan used to come to the stadium because they love the club and they want to see us win and uh, when we were losing for example i could have seen that i was so i was feeling so bad but i could have seen in the eyes of the fan the same disappointment so I'm like, okay, now we're in the same page and then we have to achieve. And then it's not just me being on the field. What I'm going to do on the field will affect the mood of those people. And then when I'm doing bad, they're still supporting me because I'm kind of the one that represents them on the field. But then we all together. And, um, and yes, I think this is something that's built up in me, like some, some, some love for them and, and then something like, kind of it's 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 an honor for me to be able to represent the club and represent you and then for you to support me to be there on the field and try to do my best so this is this is how I used to to see the game and uh, for me it was like okay we we live and die together and um and i have to give 100 percent because um you would have loved to be in my position just to defend the color of your club but then i'm the one that has this 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 role so I need to respect you by doing my best. And I think that in the same time, the fans that were there in, in, in England in, in, in general, people will judge you by, by your efforts, by what you try to do, by the fact that you, you, you're honest when you play. And my game was like that. I've always been honest. And I think this is why um, we had a, a good connection. Was Forrest different to other clubs in your experience and i know you play for birmingham you play for helsinki and angers Did, was nottingham for was forest different in a way do you think or did it stand yeah. out i think 
Nottingham, Angers, Angers is a bit like that, but I believe that Nottingham, there is a big history in the club and it's a, a big family, family club. And um, we can sense that by when I first came with, um, uh, with our chairman that passed away, um, Nigel, uh, every time before pre-season, we used to have like a, a big, um, I would say a big party in his, uh, one of his uh, mansions not, not far from Nottingham. And I remember he used to ask everybody to come with their parents, with their, with their child, with their wife. And, uh, and then we used to spend everything all together. So it was the players, but it was also the, the groundsman. It was every people from the, from the, the office in Nottingham. And uh, we were all together and then we were sharing a time before the preseason. And I remember once because I, was, uh, I came alone, but at that time, I think my mom was supposed to come. And I think she was there or not. My sister used to live in, uh, in, uh, in, in England at the time. And uh, I think she was around this weekend. And, uh, and I, was, I, was, I was shy and I say, my sister will be there. Is, am I allowed to bring my sister? Because I didn't want you to, to, make, to, to feel like I bring my, all my family to, an, uh, to something that's not, they're not related to the, the football club. And they were like, no, no, no. Yes, of course. That's what we're waiting. And then if, they have, if she has ch a child, bring the child also and, uh, and then his boyfriend. And I was kind of shocked and I was like, okay. And then I've seen, and then I, wa I wasn't talking English. I wasn't speaking English. So I was really observing. So all those things, I was just like sit back and observe everybody. and was seeing the connection. Everybody knew each other, everybody helping each other. And I think it's something that even nowadays you don't see that much because there is new owners. So the, the DNA of the club sometimes disappeared because the people that has been in the club for years, they're not in the club no more. So it's difficult to find this in, 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 in some football clubs right now. Yeah, it felt like back then the club was geared up for the Premier League That when you finished third and made the playoffs two years in a row. I mean, how painful was it that you, you fell short? Did it feel like that was your big chance then to play in the Premier League? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I still have, you know, when you when when we see that we've, we were enjoying with the fans and suffering with the fans, I still remember when we lost against Swansea away from home in the last, the second leg of the playoff. I remember coming to, I remember coming to the, um, to the fans, they were in the stadium and then I was staring at them. We were staring at them and then we were looking each other in the eyes and didn't know what to say. Could have seen people crying and stuff like that. And uh, and then we, I have no words. And then we were driving back to Nottingham. Nobody was talking in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a couch, in a bus. And uh, at some point we stopped by um, a service, services to grab some, some water or whatever. And we, some fans were there crying they haven't seen us arrived but then they just like they were crying and then now suddenly you arrive and some of them that didn't want it to talk to us because it was too painful some of them come to us and try to tell us oh we're so disappointing some of them were mad it was a mix of a mix of feeling but it was horrible and then after that i remember i went back home and um i was on the i was in bed i couldn't sleep so i sometimes i used to just watch uh, sky sports news and then we're putting the game again and the game again has to stop the TV and I couldn't sleep for for two to two, three days really but then after that for a month I was affected but for two to three days I was like I can't sleep I will sleep one hour two hours and I was thinking about it I was like repeating all the action and we could have done that like this we could have done this like that oh, it was horrible what did the club change after that because Billy went, Steve McLaren didn't stick around, Sean O'Driscoll, Steve Cottrell, I think you were there when McLeish was there, and then Billy again. Mm. Did you feel the club changing in those last two or three years at Forest? Uh, f yes, I think things changed because obviously the chairman passed away. But even before that, I think Billy Davis, Billy Davis left. And um, I think potentially maybe one of our mistakes is, um, is because we reached the playoff twice in a row, and we were so close to uh, to get promoted that maybe unconsciously we believe that doesn't matter what we're going to do now we're one of the team in the championship and uh, we're going to be in a playoff minimum and uh, but there is a there it was also some changing in terms of players 
Like, um, I think uh, David McGoldrick left on loan or he wasn't playing that much. Uh, Robbie Finlay was there, yes. The Nathan Tyson wasn't there no more. Uh, we had a few players, I think um, uh, Ryan Bertrand went back to Chelsea. Uh, Nicky Shirley went back to West Brom, I think it was. Uh, we have a few new players. And uh, the problem is we have like few players also out of contract. And at the time, we were young and, uh, you know, I don't think that the, the club at the time wanted to to invest that much on some of the players that was there out of contract. And the problem is their mind wasn't there, wasn't there either. So for them, it was potentially, and I understand, OK, they don't want to send me a new deal, so potentially maybe I'm going to play. Uh, my game, try to do my best, and if you reach the playoff anywhere, or maybe another team will sign me or will sign for another club because I don't have any contract uh, for, for the next season. So it was really complicated to play with a player that was potentially out of contract in the end of the season and didn't know if they would have stayed with us. So they unconsciously, even though I know that none of them would, would have said that um, I tried to be or I was 50%. But if you want to be committed 200%, you have to be committed to the club anyway. So you have to have a contract. And uh, I think that was potentially the problem, and especially when we faced difficulties, because me, I was out of contract when we reached the playoff against Swansea and uh, the, 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 that year. But then I was playing week in, week out. The team was doing extremely well. The, 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 the spirit inside the team in the changing room was extremely good. But then when you find some difficulties uh, in the fourth year, when Billy David left, it wasn't the same because some people were out of contract, but we were like almost in the bottom of the table. So now you're like, oh, it's not the same. It's not the same energy. Mm. Did you ever have a chance to go? I remember reading uh, Everton were interested in you and Wigan, and I think maybe West Brom teams in the Premier League wanted you. Was that? Did, did you ever have a chance to leave? Was that just paper talk? Mm, I think yes. It was a. It was real, real talk and real discussion with the teams. And um, uh, up to this day, I don't even know why that didn't happen. You know, sometimes there is things uh, under the under uh, in, in between closed door that we don't we doesn't know. And uh, but then for me, the aim was to say that I would have left potentially as a personal challenge to be able to challenge myself on the Premier League because this is what was driving me. And this is what dri was driving me also with my, tar my target with Forest, because as I said, my plan was to play for in the Premier League, and my dream was to potentially achieve that with Nottingham Forest. But then if I would have had the, the chance to do it with another team, I would have taken the chance for the personal reason, you know, to, to challenge your chef against the best, etc., etc. But then uh, I had interest for all the teams in championship, but I always say that doesn't matter the money or whatever, I will never leave Nottingham Forest for another championship team. And uh, when I signed back, when I re-signed my three, my three year deal, I have two offers on the table with better money and with sign and fee, and I refused them. Because I was like, it's no point for me. I'm like, for me in my mind, I was, we, we, we lost twice in a row the playoff. So potentially next year, we have to do everything to be automatic promoted. So, we were in a good team, so I wasn't expecting to to the fourth season to be in the bottom of the league. So I was like, I love the city, I love the fan, I love the, my friend that I have here now, and my teammate was the point to live with uh, for another team. Why? While I mean, potentially for for me, I was in the best team in championship or the best club in championship. So I wanted to achieve that with the with the fans and the teams and my teammate. What happened when you did leave Forest then? Because you were so embedded here and so happy here. I, I guess you wanted to stay. Was this no offer on the table? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's the last year was a little bit complicated because it was a lot of, um, I would say, drama inside the behind closed door, inside the changing room. Um, and then with the chairman also that wanted to do his best, I believe, you know, which is uh, Fawaz. But then uh, we can criticize him as much as we can. But then in the end, he put his money uh, on the table. He done the wrong decision. But then as human, we make wrong decision. But then for me, 
he wanted the best for the club, but he went wrong on the, the decision that he made. But uh, and then the decision that he made has a huge impact on the changing room also. And uh, for me, it was really, really, really complicated because I was I was thinking that all the the things that I love about the club, the 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 the, the, the team spirit, the family, the the like the the family, a family club were disappearing because of all those things that were happening with flowers and um, that has a huge effect on my on my mind and uh, that has a huge effect on my game also and uh, as, uh, as much as uh, as i didn't want it to leave i needed also to have um to have a refresh a fresh challenge something i wanted to change i needed something and um and then this is how I ended up in Birmingham City. And um, as I say, the way that I've been connected to the club, it's because of who I am and then fighting for the same target and, and then working for, the, for a football club that we all love potentially. And I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel, feel the same things also in, uh, in Birmingham. But the history of Nottingham Forest is a little bit special because even when I came, we were a young team, and some of the and then I think the squad they were almost together for already two years, so I was jumping in a, in, in in a group of, of 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 with a group of players that I know for from a long period of time, while when I arrived in Birmingham, it was like ten new players or fifteen new players from the year co compared to the year before, so. It's, people that is almost like people coming just to to play football and then have their own personal goals and not a collective goals and um, this is how I felt a little bit and uh, my adaptation my adaptation took too long and then and then after that I decided to go to to Helsinki in Finland because I wanted another break far from everybody and far from everything I needed to to, you know, to, to play again football, be far from everything. And, and it was really hard, you know, at, at, at Birmingham and then especially because we had to play against Nottingham Forest at the city ground. Me coming back to the city ground, uh, going to the, um, to the changing, room, changing room of the opposite team, yeah. having to take hands of everybody that I, I appreciate or I love. And, uh, and then I'm like, passing the changing room, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the wrong changing room, like, where am I going? And uh, and then I was on the bench, and I remember going to to run on the side, to warm up, the fan being happy to see me, but I'm like, I was like, I'm not fighting for the right thing. Like, I was like, it's almost like my people are there, and then they're still giving some love, and then you send me some love, but I cannot, I think I cannot give you the love back by fighting for you in the field because I'm gonna fight against you. So it was like it was kind of tricky. It was it was so bizarre. And um, yes, and after that, I decided because in my mind also, remember, I set up my mind by saying I will never play for another team that uh, in championship if it's not Nottingham Forest. And then now I come back to to the the city ground, and then it's, and then I play against Nottingham Forest. While in my mind I set up my mind that I will never play for another team that Nottingham Forest in championship. After that was I I need to go away. I want to ask you one more thing about Birmingham in a minute, but picking up on what you said about Forest, Sean O'Driscoll was on here and um, talking about Fawaz. Uh, along the same lines as yourself, you know, he put his money where you know back in into the club. But Sean was saying, you know, he was saying to Fawaz, you're paying these players too much money. P please stop giving out big contracts. I is that what you were kind of referring to there? Of It was difficult with dressing room dynamics and did it change the spirit of the club when all these new players were coming in on huge money? For me, the money wasn't a big issue because I remember it's all the matter of how are you going to talk to the player? And then with Fawaz, it was almost like he signed some players and he gave them more than the money, he gave them some power to be potentially in the same level of, of the manager because he gave them the power to be able to speak directly with, with him, mm. which he was kind of confrontation for, for a coach because he's like, 
oh, you're not playing Gimus, and then I, I pick up my phone and I ring Fawaz, I say, oh, I'm not happy. And then because Fawaz is was uh, the, the, the mentality potentially in the Middle East is different than here in Europe, and the chairman over there, they're really connected with the players also. And then some of the players, if they wasn't happy, they would have picked up the phone and ring Fawaz, and Fawaz would have react like there is no uh, hierarchy. So you would have speak directly to them instead of saying, oh, you have to speak with the, the, the manager first. So it brings some conflict in the changing room in the way that um, some of the players would have said, oh, we have players here that they're different than us because they can speak directly to, to, the, to the chairman. While us, if we have a problem, we have to go through the, the manager. And in the same time, the manager also wanted to know what's going to happen in his changing room. But then, because sometimes he has to refer it after that to the chairman. But then sometimes the chairman has information even before the manager, because some of the players used to go straight for to, to the chairman. So I think all those things put some really, you know, a bad atmosphere in the changing room, more than I would say the money or whatever, because in the end we know that in football there is money, and uh, if someone would have come with humility and, uh, you know, just do his job, uh, fair play for him if you have good money. It's, it wasn't a, we never even talked really, I remember those those years when we reached the playoff, we never really talked about the, the wages or how much do do uh, Wes Morgan have or Guy or Lewis. We never talked about it. We were just like focused on the field, try to do our best, bunch of friends and that's it. Um. You talk about money. You went to Birmingham and you took a salary off them, but you gave the, you gave it all away to, to to charity, which is a very unusual move for uh, anyone in any walk of life. Can you tell people, you know, why you did that and what was the thinking behind it? Um, for me, it was I wanted to go back to the pure love of football and try to say that I'm not. So basically, when I signed there, I signed for two to three months, I think something like that. And then for me, it was a challenge to take. So at first. Um, Money-wise, when I, I start to negotiate the contract, because I had a good contract at Forest, the club would have w was like, oh, you know, uh, we can't pay the same things. That, and then for me, it's like when we started the discussion before before the inter we started this interview. As I said, I love football more than anything. I really love football. So it's like now, sometimes I play with friends, and I'm as happy as when I was playing at Nottingham Forest in front of the city, in front of the fan in the city ground, and then. I hated when a manager used to come to me and talk, talk to me about money. Oh yes, but you know, uh, I want you to come to me. Okay, what type of experience can you can you bring to the team? This is the formation that I want to play. How can you fit this formation? What do you think? You know, life for me is is uh, exchanging and passing your your knowledge. You know, your experience, and I wanted to do that. And uh, they come to me uh, most likely about money, and then for me, anyway, I've always been doing things with charity and uh, for me it was two things i wanted to send some money to some from some charities and in the same time it was a message to tell them maybe my ego to tell them stop stop talking to me about money just let like, you know i come in like i left nottingham forest for example i left good people that i like here now i just want to enjoy football so don't talk to me about money because sometimes they talk to you about money. They say, okay, we're going to pay you that much. And they try to put pressure on you on, on yeah, but if you, you've been paid that much, that means you have to behave like that. And as I say, I'm not some, someone that they're going to put, uh, put money on me or give me money and say that because, because you give me the money, then I'm going to do 200%. Now, if we shake hands and I tell you that, okay, this is what I can do and you ask me to do it, then I don't need the money to give, me, to, to give you 200% because it's my word and that worth more than money. And uh, so I had like a big problem with that at the time when they were talking a little bit about money. And uh, in the same time, that was my way to be able to say, you know what, I don't want you money in a certain way, but you know, we're going to do something good. We're going give it, to give it to charity because I used to do that. And so this is, this is how we, that's happened. You, well, you stopped playing when you were about 31. Did you just, I mean, a lot of players stop playing so they just can't get a club or they just get injured. It sounds to me like you play a lot on emotion. I mean, did you just fall out of love with the game for a while there and that had enough? Hundred percent. I think um, I had the opportunity to uh, to to play. I think for me it was like I always wanted to play in Premier League, for example. And uh, for me, it's like I was doing my maths. I'm like, okay, I make a lot of you know sacrifice to be able to keep improve, like keep uh, keep playing at the best level. But then I was seeing that. 
even with the effort you have the game has been now built up in a certain way that a youngster when he play maybe we can transfer him and make money so it become a, a business more more than oh you still have the quality or you better than him you may be better than him but then because he's younger than you then the game change and we'd be like no okay give you good but this one is younger he can still improve and then we can still make money by gain some making some transfer and uh, so as i said i started to talk with people and then instead of talking to me about football they were talking to me about about uh, about money oh how can you do this how can you do that instead of saying you know what we don't have that much money but this is what we're going how we want you to fit into the team play like this talk with the youngsters do this do that you have a, a role you know when i start to play football we have some experienced player and they were like to give to give the knowledge to give the experiences like in life you have your parents or you have the well, people are older than you and they try to give you advice in life and i think for me in every every job or whatever or anything in life it's about going through your own experience and try to help other people not making the same mistake and uh, so it's something that what that i was looking for when i was playing football okay at some point i will be able to, to be the one that's gonna tell to people give them some advices but then the game changed and then, and as you say i've uh, I was like, I was disappointing and didn't, the, le the love of the game, I lost it. I never lost the love of football, but I lost the, lo the love of the game. Yeah, the, the game on the pitch, you still love to play everything around yeah. it. You, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you finish playing, the, it must be a like a watershed moment where, moment where you, I know you're in business now, but you must think, oh, what the hell am I going to do now? Was it a... Uh, a bit of a crossroads for you in life at that moment then yeah that was difficult because um but then you know um I'd, i had a really big injury when i started playing football in 2004 so when i was 18 19 and uh so i done my acl so it is a, it's a big injury and i remember at the time they used to say oh maybe you won't be able to play no more etc etc and then so it built up in my mind like a, a, a strong mindset by saying doesn't matter i will always get back if i decided to nobody's going to tell me that i'm not i won't be able to play football no more and um and then basically uh from that also i always be something always been in my mind by saying that yes okay that's great to think like this that's great to make the effort to not get injured or that that or a big injury that will stop you from playing football but then if that happened by bad luck what are you going to do so since 19 i've always thought about what would be next what would be next what would be next and um yes yeah, so when it arrived at that time i wasn't expected to, to stop my at that age or or to decide to stop playing because in my mind I was thinking I want to challenge myself and go and play until I don't know 38 years old something like that 40 years old why not because I was thinking I was watching uh, Ryan Gings or, or stuff like that play until 40 years old I was saying yes if they can do that I can do that it's just a mindset I need to set up my mind I can do it so so when it's when this happened this situation happened I have to decide why well, I'm currently playing football or I'm stopping playing football it wasn't easy. How did you come to... Well, can you tell people what you do now and how you came into it? Yes. So, um, funny part is, you know, when, when, when I come to, to England, I understand a little bit the no pain, no gain. So, to make you an example, French people, we kind of lazy, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, let's say when we are training at uh, in France, let's say 9... 9 a.m. on the morning, it was 9 for 9.30. So you have to be in the change room at 9 and the training started at 9.30. All we were doing is the one that will arrive at 8.59 without <laughs> being caught by the, by the manager and without having a fine. So we are always been like one minute, <laughs> two minutes. And then when I came here, it's like, I remember seeing Jamel Lassell or other player or Ben Osborne or whatever. It was the training was at 10 30 for 11 and they were there at nine with the academy at the beginning doing some stretching doing some exercise so then you know it start to to change a little bit my mind and so basically um when i left helsinki i came back to nottingham with philippe montagnier i wanted to train with them and uh, in the in the possibility of signing a new deal um i remember the 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 the, the sport director at the time lalu 
uh, say to me, yes, we are short of players, or you know, we may have a deal on the table if things happen and if the manager is is happy with it. And uh, one of the training, when the team was off, I asked the fitness coach to go and train, and I trained with them and uh, uh, with him in one v one, and I dam and um, I damaged something on my knee, so I felt something on my knee. So I, I went for a scan, and it was just my meniscus. So I just needed like to wash out my knee, and and maybe in four weeks I would have I, I would have been back on the field. So when I came back up, and uh, so I went to a, a friend to do the operation. I came back up in uh, at Forest, and uh, Torpy, one of the the strength and condition and uh, coach in uh, at Forest, start to work with me with her devices. And uh, so basically, the devices is a devices uh, is like um. A cuff, let's say a cuff, and then basically he put that cuff around my limb, and he put some pressure on it, like a, a let's say a blood pressure cuff, and uh, he said to me, "Okay, now do the exercise." I'm like, what is it? Uh, for me, in my mind, it was November. I was thinking like maybe if you get back fully fit before December or before January at least, maybe you can be potentially signing a new deal or whatever. So I was like, what is it? So he's explaining me something called blood flow restriction training. And uh, so he tried to explain me a little bit the way it works. And I didn't really picture. So uh, I was like, when he was tuning his head, I was taking it off and putting a lot of normal, big way to be able to work to increase my muscle strength. And then finally, when I came back on the field, I still have pain because I wasn't, I wasn't strong enough. And then from that, it was January, and uh, they signed all the players. And then um, I spoke with Gary Brazil. He advised me to um, to do my to pass my coaching badges, which I've done. So I've done my my I passed my UFAB coach coach at uh, St. George's Park. And then in the same, so it was during the summer, so six months after the January transfer window. And at the same time, one of my friends, so which is uh, an ex-professional athlete, also we played together in Angers, my former team. Uh, he came to me with this project, so, and he talked to me about blood flow restriction training. So and I was like, hold on a minute. So I show him a picture because I've got a picture when I was working with working with it, with it at Nottingham Forest, and I say, this is what we work at. Uh, this is what we use at Nottingham Forest. I was like, yes, this is something like that that I want to I want us to build up, but automatically. And to explain why is blood function training, so basically it's a smart way to be able to increase muscle strength. So let's not talking about performance. Whatever, if you're in rehabilitation, you try to increase the muscle strength to be able to work better, to have be better muscle functionality. If you're 60 years old or, or 70 years old, you're losing your muscle strength. The only way to increase your muscle strength is by doing exercise. But maybe at 60 or 70, you won't be able to do that. If you're in performance, like in a football club, for like Nottingham Forest at the moment, like let's take let's take the example of Chris Cohen for instance. Chris Cohen had, uh, has some problem with his knee, and he was doing some big pre-season, increasing the muscle strength on his knee. But because of lot of cardio, you're doing you you losing muscle strength because you do a lot of cardio, you're running a lot, so you, you you're losing your strength. So therefore, after a month, two months, or three months, he starts to have pain in his knee because there is no more muscle to be able to absorb the impact on his joint. So for him, the aim to be able to carry on walking, he needed to leave heavy load in the in the objective of build up muscle strength. But then to leave heavy load, you when while using heavy load, he put pressure on his joint, so it's painful. So blood function training is a smart way to have this cuff um, that would be around your limb. Uh, and then the devices that we build up will analyze the right pressure for an individual. So it will individualize the pressure. And then from that, you put a certain pressure on your limb to reduce the circulation of the, of the blood. And then from that, you do an exercise. And then physiologically, by lifting, when you have this, this pressure on your limb and you add it with, let's say, a 10 kilogram uh, weight and you do an exercise, you will have, I try to exaggerate, but you will have the same physiologic benefit as lifting 70 kilograms, for example. Mm. But then you won't put pressure on your joint. So if we're talking about rehabilitation, you've been operated, you have an operation, you cannot lift heavy load because you're weak, then, but you still have able to be able to do a normal functional movement, then you add this on your leg and it will be similar as heavy load. So if you're in rehabilitation stage or like Chris Cohen, you know, in rehabilitation, but you're in performance, 
but then you don't want to lose your muscle strength otherwise you will start to have pain then sometimes you can work on this and and then for example if you're a person that as i say 70 or 60 years old you never done sports but then you start to lose your muscle autonomy that's why our parents are elder elderly people they gain old or they go to our scarces because they lose the muscle autonomy but within this you just have to do light load exercise within five six minutes without dumbs because you don't leave heavy load so you won't break down the muscle fiber so within five minutes i will be able to give you the same benefit if you would have been between with a hundred kilograms for example for 45 minutes so that's why we build up and that's why we i'm i'm doing right now to be to be uh, honest and do you run this from nottingham or are you back in paris now are you based in nottingham still yes yes now i'm in nottingham but uh so we're starting to uh, commercialize the devices uh, beginning of 2019. And um, so we use our network as a, because we three co-founder of the devices and three ex-professional footballer. So we have a network in the, in the professional environment. So we use our network to be able to, to target the football club. So today we're working for, with big famous team, uh, a famous team such as Barcelona, PSG, uh, Liverpool, Manchester United, Inter Milan, uh, FC Porto, uh, and so on and so on. And um, so basically, in also, it allowed us to go in an in international market. So today, we in uh, 15 different European countries, and we also in the in Middle East, in North Africa, and uh, we just enter also the, the North, North America. So, um, so we have the main company, which is in France, and we have the UK company also, which I run on my own. And uh, yes, we are a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little bit everywhere. So I'm based in Nottingham. So my main house is in Nottingham, but uh, I keep traveling. So you must really love Nottingham then. I mean, you could have you know, gone back to Paris and lived the lifestyle there. I mean, yeah, Nottingham yeah. has a big place in your heart then still. Yes, honestly, I'm like, the mentality is also, the, the English mentality is different than the French one. You know, it's, um, I won't know how to explain, but in French, we always grumpy. We never happy. You, you go in France, people always grumpy, unhappy. Even when you want to send them some nice energy, they... People are like that in every country, but I feel like in France is, is, is even more. And then all the French people, they will tell you the same. And then even English people, when they go to France and they ask people for a direction, they will always tell you, oh, French people, they're rude. Because they, when you ask them a question, they don't speak English and they, they do just don't talk to you and they ignore you or whatever. That's French people. Where do you consider yourself to be from then? I mean, you know, you grew up in France. Uh, you spent a lot of time in Nottingham. I mean, are you are you Guy from Paris, or where where do you think of yourself as from now? I'm a citizen of the world. I love traveling. I love discovering new cu culture. Um, I'm born in France, but I'm African and proud of it. My parents are born and raised in Cameroon, so I grew up in France, but with a, a strong, uh, you know, uh, I would say Cam Cameroonian background and Cameroonian education and uh, and then I arrive here in UK and uh, and I buy to the UK education also or to the people that I met here and uh, I met some American like Robbie Finlay I met some some uh, some English guy with a background of Jamaica like um, Wes Morgan Kelvin Wilson Louis McGugan so I buy to understand also this kind of mentality and then it was uh, some also Irish people, some uh, some Sc some Scottish people. So I would say that the, the, the football allowed me to discover the world a little bit. I went to Helsinki and I met up some people from the Scandinavian country that they're different also. I met some uh, uh, some friends there from Japan and I'm aware I'm, I'm also went to Japan uh, for two weeks. So Yes, I don't know. I, I believe that, you know, I want to say that I'm a citizen of the world. <laughs> and um, if I'm uh, French uh, from Cameroon and uh, English a little bit also. Uh, but yes, I'm, um, I'm a citizen of the world. We uh, all are you, women. 
are you a so in these days are you a businessman or are you a retired footballer? How, what would you put on your business card? Uh, I'm, I don't like I'm I'm not playing football professionally, but I never say that I'm retired because I want to put the fact that football was professional football was just a bon a, a bonus on what I love. What I love is football, and that doesn't matter if I'm professional or not. And uh, I think, and it's and then sometimes it's an advice that I give to the youngsters is, don't get involved in the love of the game. Love the football, not the game. The minute you start to be involved too much in the game and the lifestyle of the game, then soon as you're going to be disappointed, you will think that I don't love football. Football and the game of football is two different things. And uh, if you want to say that I'm re retired from the game of football, I'm retired from the game of football. But I will never be retired of football because it doesn't matter. Sometimes I play some uh, power league or when I'm in France, we have something similar as power league. It's called uh, five-side football. And I am guarantee you will see people that 55 years old, 60 years old, they come with the all the outfit with the the shin pads the the the, the old outfit of paris saint germain and they come inside the you know the the pitch like the neymar or something and then when they're gonna pass the ball they can't even pass the ball and i love that and i love that because they're the first one also that will tell you come on pass they, they were looking at me you can't control you have to control the ball like that and pass the ball here and you're like yo everybody is a coach there <laughs> while you can't even play football but it's funny it's funny <laughs> So do you still have a kickabout on Forest Rec then, pre-pandemic? You you might go down yeah. and have a kickabout with you know your mates and everything. So there is I have two groups in Nottingham. Sorry, there is the Thursday night football with uh, with Jim, Jeremy Griffins, the the doctor of Nottingham Forest, and uh, okay. some boys. So we always play together on the Thursdays sometimes. And there is another another group of uh, players which is the the Friday night football. At Forest at Forest Field with uh, Pat Samba Fitness, so it's a guy, a French uh, guy, French Congolese guy from, uh, uh, he's from France, and he came to UK also to Nottingham for a ride back. He worked a lot with the community, and he organized some games with the people from the community every Friday around uh, eight, I think eight to ten, something like that. So every time I'm around, I manage to go, and tomorrow there will be uh, a game, so I will jump over there and uh, play a little bit with them, you know. I just wanted to finish by asking you a few quick fire forest ones, if you don't mind, just to finish us off. Um, what's your favourite forest game? Oh, Derby away. Derby <laughs> away when we won 1 0. And yeah. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, this is one. I've gone off on a tangent now. I mean, what were the Derby games like? Then you talked about playing in France and there being 12,000 there for a decent Derby. Is it, it's a different world in England, is it? It's different because. Big and then, and even I, I think even compared to the derbies nowadays, um, it's different because at the time we have Billy Davids that used to those I would say he didn't like um, the manager of um, of derby at the time. Oh. Nigel Clough. Nigel Clough. He <laughs> didn't like Nigel Clough. Nigel Clough didn't like Billy Davids. And then we have Robbie Savage also. People have issue with Robbie Savage. And then we have Chris Commons, that used to be the superstar at Nottingham Forest that signed for Derby. So everybody hated him. And now we have to play it against each other. And uh, oh, it was crazy. The atmosphere was crazy, crazy. And um, But yes, I remember the first thing that when I signed to the club, they took, I remember the fans, the fans coming to me and say, hey, this date is the Derby. Do whatever you want. Lose some game in the league, not too much, but lose some game. But this one, you know, allowed. I said, like, whoa. And then on top of that, they tell me, you have to kick Chris Common. If you kick, if you break Chris Common's legs, then oh, you're the legend of the club. I was like, wow. <laughs> oh, it was, yeah. it was a different, it was a different, the derby was different, different. I miss that though. I miss that. Yeah, how would you have got on playing in pand in front of empty crowds during the pandemic? You play, you thrive on the crowds. I guess you wouldn't have actually enjoyed it much, would you? Playing today? Oh, I would have been horrible. Mm. Oh, I, I can't. I don't even watch football no more. Even mm. I barely watch the forest, the forest matches, or follow the result because it's, I think it's horrible. So I can't even imagine the player. Because as I said, 
I'm someone like when I run, it, when I go to the field and I'm listening this this music of the city ground, and then I see all the fans, the fans singing together, I'm breathing this energy. I'm like, okay, let's go to the war. But now you don't have that. Hmm. Oh, it must be horrible. Um, but let me get back to those last couple of questions, the quick fire ones to finish this off. Um, who was the best player you played with in Forest? The best player I played? Uh, um, hmm, that's a good question. I will stick to him, even though I play with a lot of good players. But then I always say that the one that gave me a real headache, because we play first against him before he come and sign for us, it was David, David McGodrick. Ah, okay, that's interesting. But he used to play a different role, though. He used to mm. play as a number ten in between the lines, and uh, at the time when we when I arrived in UK, I feel like it was too much um, individual marking. Which means, if you're clever, you used to play against me or some some of the French team that we play against, they would have popped the ball around you because you're just running everywhere. You're not compact. And I think at the time when I play against him, he was a number 10, kind of a, like uh, a nine plus, so a number 10. And it was always in my back. And it was the first time that when I arrived in UK, I've seen a player playing like French player, staying behind the, the, the pocket and stuff like that. So I was like, no, it was a, a big challenge. And when he came to the club, I was like, he's really a player that need to have the the right coach to to be to be to bring the best out of him and then even today i've seen him playing uh, as a as a pure striker in uh with uh, with um with sheffield but for me when he used to play as a number 10 poof, he was amazing um last question who is your best friend at forest wow that's a tough one that's a tough one. I was really close to everybody. I don't know, but I was hanging out a lot with Radi Majewski. I was good with Chris Cohen also because Chris Cohen and Radi Majewski, we always used to be out first in the, in the field and try to play two touch game. All the time, all the time, all the time. And, uh, but um, uh, yes, I liked Wes Morgan, Kelvin Wilson, all, all of them, because basically they all welcome me really well. And then up to today, I can give them a call and go to, to catch up with them. And uh, they will pick up the phone and uh, we're still all kind of close. We're not hanging out together because, you know, we have all personal reason. We have, all, you know, obligation or whatever. But then like even the physio, so he's, they're not the player, but then the physio at the time, like uh steve and auntie are still sometimes I, I keep on sending jokes to to um to steve divine which is the the he was the now he's a physio at derby so we we always i always send him i say oh, i can't be i can't believe that you betray us or this stuff like <laughs> and uh and then every time that we used to have a game uh, uh, uh he used to have like um a rugby game so when french was playing against ireland we always take in each other and uh so yes it's Recently, Amy Sutton, that used to, uh, you know, the, the the daughter of um, of uh, 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 Steve Sutton. Yeah, Steve Sutton. Yeah, I I was with I was exchanging with her like a month ago. Mm. And uh, yeah, so so Keith, Keith Bird that bring me to Nottingham Forest, which was the the sport director at the time. As she is like from for for him, he's like I'm his son, and for me, one of like I would say. One of my parents, my my parents here, you know, there is Jim King, for example, also Jim King, he passed away, but then his wife, Hillary, I'm like, I need to go to see her because it's a while, but then uh, I was in touch with, with them also. Mm, yeah, he was like um player liaison, I suppose it would be, so yeah. he helped all the players out, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Guy, um, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure speaking to you for so long. I'm grateful for your time. I um, hope everyone who's listened to that enjoyed it. And do um, like and subscribe on YouTube and uh, give us a good review on iTunes. Uh, and anyone who watches this on Facebook, I, put out, I apologize for my lighting again. Uh, I'm still struggling to get uh, to grips with that. But thanks to everyone who watched along. We'll be back uh, after the Easter Games to talk about how Forest got on and hopefully they're one step closer to securing their championship status for next season. Guy, thank you again. Uh, really enjoyed that. It was really interesting. 
and we'll catch everyone soon. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you.